Hey everybody. Um, in this video, we want to talk about creating user interfaces using PyRevit and XAML on top of Revit for the tools that we are basically creating for Revit. Um, I've gotten this question a lot throughout the past couple of years. Um, I sort of like waited. So PyRevit framework is good enough that you can utilize some of its features to simplify the user interface creation in um, inside the Revit interface. Uh, so in this first video, we want to talk about what XAML is uh, and sort of like what WPF is and remove what, uh, some of these uh, confusion and sort of like complexity about these, these topics and, and basically generally explain how these components work and how we can utilize them to create user interfaces. So most of the conversations that we're going to have in this video is not really related to Revit or anything in the specific. We're going to talk about a lot about XML, uh, the differences between document languages and normal programming languages or imperative languages and uh, declarative languages. And uh, we're going to talk about what XAML is specifically, its namespaces, and how we can use uh, Microsoft Visual Studio to sort of like edit and work with um, XAML files. Then in the next video, I'll take you through creating and setting up a um, sort of like a hello world application, some simple uh, standard tools, XAML file that we can create on top of Revit and we can create a basic window with some you know, functions and stuff in it. And then in a the third video, we'll dive uh, a little bit deeper into how uh, designing and programming graphical user interfaces work in general on most of the operating systems today. So let's uh, talk about the difference between a programming language or an imperative language versus a declarative language. Um, I want to get rid of some of these notes here. Um, an imperative programming language looks like this, like Python. Um, when you um, sort of like, you know, you have commands and f actions and mathematics and stuff like that that you can use to um, describe that they basically create that logic that you are um, you have for your algorithm inside the programming code. Um, if I want to create a um, let's say let's say a a button using a programming language, it would generally look like this. I'm typing sudo um, sudo code. It's not a very in any specific programming language. Um, so I would say button is my variable. Then I would create an instance of a button class. And then I have to go and say button the title, for example, equals, you know, my button, which this would be the, uh, the title for that button. And then button for the click would be, would be a function that does something, um, performs a task, uh, task or, an, uh, or something else. Or let's say in this case, it closes a, uh, closes a window or something like that. Um, it would basically look like this. But imagine for every button that you're creating on that user interface, you have to put this code in here for different buttons and then create different names and stuff like that. Uh, so creating user interfaces using imperative programming language is very clumsy. Uh, you have to write a lot of code to create something that could very easily be visually described or described in a, uh, using, a pro using a language that is sort of like um, created specifically for that purpose. Um, so let's move to a chart. We human beings really like um, laying things out in rectangular fashion. We really like rectangular kind of documents. So um, if I want to draw a document here, let's say this is a page, just a normal paper page that we work with. Um, and it would have a header section that I'm going to put some header in it. Um, let's duplicate that, bring that here, create a footer section and create a sort of like an article section. This is where, where my main article goes or where, where the main content of the letter goes and stuff like that. Imagine this is, this is a letter. Um, you can create this kind of a um, sort of like page using an imperative programming language. So this would be um, page, give me a new page. And then uh, let's say header, give me a new header. And then um, article would be create a new article. And then footer would be a new footer. And then I have to go and say, okay, so page now add the header to it. 
and the order here is important and then page dot add article because it comes uh, after the header uh, so if you want to take a look at this imagine everything is being created um, from top to bottom the normal flow of a document a page and then I would say page add um, the footer now if my footer contains any text I have to set those stuff in here so footer text would be the information about the t uh, footer the article I have to add the article here text would be the text to my article and then the header maybe the header has a sort of like a date time section that I have to set uh, and I have to go grab the date time whatever from the you know today is let's say there's a function that pulls today I'm going to use that and then the header maybe the, there's a logo on the header so there's a function that says grab logo um, and maybe the header also has a title that I have to set so as you can see um, there's quite a quite a lot of programming code that you have to create and this is a very very simple example it gets more complex when you're actually creating uh, complex documents that are they need to be fluid things need to move around and stuff like that and the properties need to be able to change easily and you want to be able to reuse components and stuff um, so the general approach sort of like you know when smart people saw this they're like well we kind of need a different language to describe documents and a lot of times there's on this other side of the uh, the danger is that like I can I just want to see this document I don't want anything else I don't want any logic interactivity and stuff like that but if a an actual general purpose programming language is creating this document for me um, there's really nothing that would stop it from I don't know go files you know read all files files and delete um, like it could do other stuff while it's creating the document for me so it's better to have a language that describes the document that can't really do anything else except for creation of that document. Um, these kind of languages are called declarative programming. They're, they're document languages, but they're a type of declarative programming languages. Instead of sort of like creating the logic and providing commands and functions and mathematics and stuff like that, you declare what you want to see using pre-existing known components. And that's a very important concept that you can't create stuff that don't exist you have to reuse the existing components that are known to be able to sort of like generate this this document that you're working so if uh, that let's say that declarative language that you were working with that document language that you're working with doesn't have a concept of a header you won't be able to create this header because the it's not a general purpose uh, programming language it can only use the components that are sort of like described in that language so Again, in pseudocode, if you want to um, sort of like say, let's create that kind of a language for us and um, declare what we want, the new description for this page would look like, let's say we have a page and then we have a header and then we have an article section and then we have a footer. And then maybe for the article, would, we would say like title equals whatever and then the um, date time equals some date time and then let's say the logo would be a path to an image something like that and then the article would have the text and then the footer will also have the text let's say so we kind of define our own format here there's no need to do this anymore because we already have the parent and you're describing the structure of that page and the ordering of these components and which component is the children of what other component who's the parent and stuff like that uh, using a very specific specifically designed uh, declarative language that describes this document um, as you can see this is a lot shorter first of all um, it can't do anything else other than creating a document which is really good it's very safe um, and it's a lot easier to sort of like read 
as a human being. It's it resembles the structure of that document that you're working with. This is hard to understand, like which one is which and who is the children of what and stuff like that. And then for every component, you have a bazillion different lines that describe other things in it, which sort of, you know it's just too much and it's very um, it's very clumsy. So over the life of I don't know in the computer revolution, these uh, document languages have become very popular to define um, certain documents. Two of the two of the very very famous types of these uh, these documents are XML and a which is stands for uh, extended markup language um, and markup language being this sort of like you define declare something and it's generally called a, called a markup language. And one of the other ones is HTML, uh, which you most probably know from uh, working with internet and web pages and stuff like that. So if I go, let's say open a browser, go to one of these pages that I pulled up, and I'm gonna open the develop uh, menu and go to my web inspector so I can see this uh, the source code for this page. Um, you can see that this uh, document this page that I'm looking at, um, actually, first of all, it resembles a, a normal rectangular document that we work with. It has multiple different sections. The flow is from top to bottom, just like any other paper document that we work with. Uh, so again, we love this stuff and we designed the web to kind of look like that too. Um, you can see that at the root, just like the page, there's an HTML component that basically says everything else under me is an HTML. Um, if I open that, there's a head section. Um, now, each one of these components is known, like the, the, this web browser that renders this page understands uh, from before what a head is, what an HTML is, what a body is. So all these components that we are actually using to describe this document are previously known. None of these are really new. Uh, none of them are created inside this little uh, web page that we are running. Um, so it already knows what head is. It has some components in it. It has a very specific purpose in the HTML uh, convention. And then we have the body, which is the actual body of the code that we have, the, um, the page that we have. As you can see, I, I'm hovering over these sections and we can see that we have different components in here. Let's go, let's actually inspect one of these uh, pieces here, here, um, this correct uh, with check, check boxes and stuff like that. It would be a span component and inside it we have a link and a link and inside that link we have other stuff and there's different classes that define this type and stuff like that but you get the idea uh, the structure of this uh, this declarative language resembles the structure of the document it can't do anything other than creating the document and it can only create the document using the previously known components now the conventions to write these and sort of like describe the language are different but it generally resembles what we wrote here, except for like it has, you know, these things around it, the angle brackets around like maybe, and then uh, instead of having a sort of like a just a page at the top, we would need to close that block using this convention. So we have we have to uh, provide you know a forward slash. Uh, to show that 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 section is closed and also the convention is that if you have a single line you kind of have to close it at the end like that so it would be it's it doesn't contain anything it's its own component and you can do that or um it gives you other flexibilities like if you don't want to describe the text here as one of the attributes of that component maybe you can do this and then provide the document text the article text inside this. Um, so the article component would contain the article text. The text is natural child of that article article component. Um, in the H, sort of like HTML XML convention, you can set the attributes of that component right in front of it inside the uh, angle bracket. So you can see here, let's say div uh, set some attributes in here. Um, here the same thing um, other other components are the same thing now most of the web most of the new web pages that we work are sort of like automatically generated using a backend engine so you see a lot of like divs and other components and stuff um, that are more generic and designed to sort of like just provide a rectangular area that could be styled and could contain other components and whatnot uh, but 
nothing really uh, sort of like is different from what we what we are uh, what we had described in the other language. So for example, this P stands for a paragraph. So it starts a paragraph, it ends the paragraph here. Inside it, you have a span, and A is in a hyperlink. And you know you can see all these different components. And you can see that sort of like this text that we have here. Let me actually go to that component. Um, where is, yeah, it's I think here, yeah. So if I hover over this, you can see that that text, this text that we're using is actually what we are um, pointing to it here. So this text, that says you are using Safari, whatever that version is inside the paragraph and is a natural child of that and it shows up in that paragraph. The paragraph itself is inside that um, sort of like is rendered as a uh, as a rectangle here with a background and a couple of other components in it. I think you get the idea. This is generally the purpose of declarative languages to describe a document. Now, well, as we mentioned, one of the most famous formats to describe a document is XML, and a, a subset of that is HTML, which is a very kind of like specific XML that is designed for uh, for web pages and whatnot. Uh, XML is more generic; it can accept um, sort of like custom components. Um, a lot of different programs use XML to describe their documents. Like for example, you could hypothetically you could define a uh, uh, what is it a, a PDF document in an XML format. You could define a user interface in an XML format. You can define, as we talked about it, HTML is a subset of XML. You could define a web page in XML kind of format, and you can use it for other you know other purposes as well. Um, the key to that is that uh, is a concept that's called XML namespaces that we'll talk about in a little bit. So. On the same concept, I'm going to get rid of these. Uh, we don't need it anymore. On the same concept of HTML being a subset of XAML, uh, XML, XAML is kind of like that. XAML is a, a it's sort of like a specific way of using XML to describe uh, user interfaces that are uh, that work basically with the .NET framework and the components that are inside it as part of the Windows Presentation Foundation. Um, so this page, if you look up what is XAML, it takes you to the Microsoft documentation page, then it you know talks about the, the fundamentals of XAML and stuff like that. But basically, what this is, it's a declarative markup language, and it's using it's designed to use the Windows Presentation Foundation or WPF components. That's why you hear WPF uh, when we talk about XAML a lot, because XAML is the sort of like a declarative language that works with these components um, inside the WPF and it can actually work with sort of like any other component that uh, is exists in your um, in your C sharp or .NET um, uh, program that or the program that you're that's actually the .NET, using the .NET framework. So um, let's go to the list and we talked about the creating GUI in code via the document languages. We talked about the difference between a programming language and a document language. And I'll kind of show you the example of uh, a sort of simple page with a header, footer, and body, or the article part. And we talked about how HTML is sort of like similarly using the same, same system to create documents. Um, now, let's dive in a little bit deeper into uh, what a XAML actually looks like. So if I want to write a very simple XAML application, XAML uh, uh, sort of like document here or interface here, um, we, we can refer to a GUI from now on, graphic user interface, because that's what we really are using XAML for to create that kind of stuff. So I'm going to get window. Uh, per XML uh, conventions, I have to close the window here. Uh, the window block is basically this. Everything inside this block is what is contained inside that window. So I can have a, uh, let's say, a button here. Uh, but my button needs a title, let's say. Now, they, some of these properties, actually, the names of them are different when we actually get to writing XAML. I'm writing it in a way that's you know more familiar. So let's say this is the title for the button, and this would be my button that does whatever. And then maybe um, our button has a height. Maybe it's 30 pixels high and then has a width. And maybe it's 150 pixels high. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a very easy system to create a window, um, create a button, and then create, set some of the attributes of that button right here on that line where we are defining the button. 
So if I decide to duplicate this and create another button, it's very easy. I'll just add another one. If I want to move, let's say, button number one, button number two, if I want to move button number two before one, I can just switch that line and it's that's it. You don't have to play with a hundred different lines that creates that button and sets the uh, right actions and properties and stuff like that. Now, there is one thing here that is very important. Now, uh, that thing is the, the XAML namespaces. So we talked about these declarative document languages uh, have a requirement of working with the components that they already know. Um, we haven't really pulled anything into this document that tells this document what window or button are. Um, that is the purpose of having namespaces inside in XAML. Uh, so I'm going to grab this and put it in there for the sake of this conversation, and we'll talk about this um, in a little bit more detail. I'm going to create the window, and in, as an attribute, I'm going to set a XML namespace. XML and S standing for namespace. And I'm going to give it a unique namespace name. Um, this namespace looks like a URL, looks like a web URL, but it's actually not. It is a URI. It's a universal resource identifier. Um, if you put this in a web browser, it doesn't take you anywhere. Uh, Microsoft used this sort of like format because it was very well, uh, very popular at the time and was very well known to describe and provide a unique ID for the XML, for this sort of like those bundle of components that are provided inside the XAML, um, XAML convention and uh, sort of like standard, right? So it's part of the Windows FX 2006 XAML presentation. Um, you don't have to really do anything with this. What this line does in front of the window, it basically provides a namespace to that engine that is reading this text file and creating those components. So that XAML engine, when it's reading this file, it sees that you want to create a window, but it really doesn't know what a window is. But because you have provided the namespace, it can look into that namespace find the actual DLLs and other components and the description uh, of what that window object is and automatically create that window object for you. If you don't provide this, the XAML engine will fail because it doesn't really, really know what window is. And that's part of the reason that you see these different namespaces in front of, uh, in front of these uh, sort of like uh, XAML components. Um, you could see namespaces that are a little bit more complex, like CLR namespace, My Utilities, it's a WPF DLL, and it's inside that assembly and is pulling some components from like another DLR or add-on and stuff like that. So there are multiple different formats to provide these namespaces and you know you'll get to learn those as you go along, learning more about XAML and whatnot. But basically just to get started, there's only two of these components that we need to put new namespaces that we need to provide that we always put those in front of the window and after that we're good to go and we can use all the XAML components that um, sort of like are provided. Uh, with the uh, Visual Studio and sort of like our, the, 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 the well-known components. Um, another thing about uh, the sort of like working with XAML is that is because it's sort of like designed to be so easy to use, it does some automatic conversions for you as well. Let's say I want to set the background color for this button. All I need to do is to provide the hash, the, um, the um, sort of like the... Um, the 16-bit kind of like hex code for that color. Any kid, you can get that, let's say, um, from a color picker on the web. Um, let's say this, let's say I want to pick that color. You can use this um, hex code for that color and you can just throw it in here. Um, the XAML engine automatically has converters to understand that, first of all, it looks up the button inside that namespace finds the background attribute and sort of like looks up what kind of data it needs, what kind of object it accepts. And then it reads the string that you provide in front of it and sort of like determines what that thing is and does the automatic conversion for it. If you want to write this in code, it would be a lot more complex. So if I say, let's say that's my button, it calls the button from uh, that namespace, which is technically if you want to create it, inside the um, inside the C-sharp word, for example, it would be, I think it's system, system.windows.controls, I think. 
dot button, something like that. That's the actual object that you want to create. And then you would say button, set all these other properties, but then you get to the background and you want to say, well, let's set the back background to that uh, in your C-sharp code. But then the, uh, actually, let's just write it as pseudocode. But then your C-sharp code fails here because the background has a, um, as a type of, I think it's a, um, I think it's a style or something like that. Uh, and it would fail because you're providing a string to it and there's no automatic conversion can be done here. So you kind of have to go and create a style first and say, you know, whatever that style is and it would use a color. So I have to create a color first and then it would be a new color that has, I don't know, these numbers in it for the RGB. And then I'm going to put that color inside that style and then I have to put this style in front of this. So it would be a lot more complex just to assign a color to a background of a uh, sort of like a component inside code. Um, so this, it's a lot more challenging that way. It's actually, uh, it wasn't a brush. It's, uh, it, it wasn't a style. It's a brush. That's what it's called. It's a, let's say it's a solid brush that we're using. And we'll get to these when we actually talk, you know, in more detail about these things. Um, so one of the very, very nice things about working with XAML is that XAML does all these automatic conversions for you. You could even use, reuse the standard uh, sort of like types that come with this, uh, with the uh, XAML convention and its standard. Like for example, you can just say red and it would pull the red for you. It understands that name. It pulls up the right value that's defined in the in the sort of like templates for red and it would use that as the um, as the color for that and you would generate the right brush and everything and it would use it on your background so it's very easy to very easy to work with and it's very easy for a human being to read this just background equals red that's all you need to know um, so now that we know these sort of like these general stuff about what XAML is let's go and create a XAML file inside Visual Studio and sort of like play with some of these components that actually come with it. I'm going to get rid of this because I don't need it anymore and I'm in my Mac OS, uh, so I'm going to switch to Windows. Here, let's open Microsoft Visual Studio and I'm going to create a new project. Um, for this example, I'm going to create it uh, using C Sharp. And I'm going to create a WPF app. Remember we talked about Windows Presentation Foundation. This is the type of app that uses the WPF framework to create its own uh, sort of like GUI. And because of that, it uses the XAML language to generate the, um, the uh, sort of like describe the, the pages and the windows and stuff like that that we have. I'm going to throw, in, throw this on my desktop right now for the sake of this presentation. And we're going to call it our uh, first WPF. I'm going to hit OK. You could pick different versions of the data framework that you're targeting and whatnot, and that's basically describe which version of this, this um, uh, XAML backend engine you want to use to create your own document. So we'll let Visual Studio to generate that uh, solution, that project for us. But all we're interested in here is really these window XAML, main window.xaml file that Visual Studio automatically opens it for you. So now if I look at this, let me actually get rid of this grid and let me get rid of all these other stuff in here. And you can see that the Visual Studio still render that uh, uh, sort of like window very easily for us without any issues. And you can see uh, I have the window document and there are a couple of properties. We have set the namespaces. These are the namespaces that we talked about. So kind of, you know, they have to be there. Don't, don't you know, pay too much attention to them. And then we're setting the title for the window so I can change that, say my app, and it would change right there. And then we can set the height of the width of the window. So let's say, I don't know, I want to make it, you know, not as tall and not as wide. And I can navigate through this interface. Uh, we can change the scaling of this, sort of like see your uh, window, um, sort of like zoom in and zoom out in, into the window. And you can see these two tabs. One gives you the XAML file, one gives you the design, which is the actual rendered XAML using the backend engine. And you can swap between the two if you want this to be at the bottom, the other one to be at the top and stuff like that. There are a couple of different uh, options that you have for the interface. You want to put them side by side, you can do that. So it's a very, very nice interface here inside Visual Studio to help you uh, design this uh, document, uh, sort of like this uh, window for yourself. 
Now, what happens if I want to, let's say, open the toolbox uh, panel here, and I look at the common WPF controls. You can see that there's a huge list of controls here. Actually, the biggest list is here under all WPF controls, but there's a pretty good list of all these known components in here that we can use. So uh, we have used button before. I'm gonna grab the button and I'm gonna place it under my window. And you can see that you know it creates a button for me. It sort of like graphically shows me how what's the you know pixel offset from the sides and whatnot. Uh, if it's tied to the to this side or uh, linked to the top, linked to the side, and not linked to either of these two sides, and then it actually generates that line of uh, XAML code for me here as well. That creates the button. Now the title for the button inside the, um, the the WPF framework is actually content, and you'll get to know why these namings are sort of like defined this way because button is very flexible and it can have other things as its contents. Like for example, I can have an image as a logo for that button and a text and maybe other components inside it. Uh, the title of a button is not always a text. It could be other stuff in it. And as I change that, you see that the values for the uh, width and height changes, the alignment changes, it gives it a margin to set these margins on the side and whatnot, and uh, a couple of different properties for that. And you can see that at the end, it will close that button because uh, we are setting all the attributes for this button on that line, and we don't really have anything inside that button. Uh, so if I, let's say I want to say, I don't know, if I want to change the phone size, I can just say phone size and I can change it to 18, let's say, and just make that text bigger, uh, the title of that button bigger. Uh, or if you want to change the border, let's say, let's see if it has a border property. Yeah, there's a border thickness. I'm going to set it to 10, make it very thick and create a button in here. We can place it somewhere on our, uh, on our uh, sort of like, you know, from a window and everything else. So this is basically what we really need. Uh, we need, we are using the Visual Studio interface to be able to sort of like, you know, um, very easily generate this um, uh, user interface for ourselves and sort of like play with the code, make adjustments to the code, see the changes, maybe even make adjustments right here in the interface and see the changes are being reflected inside the code. It's sort of like a two-way thing. Now, um, let's look at a couple of other files inside it. If you open this XAML thing in here, XAML actually doesn't have any other thing inside it. It's just a single file. But Visual Studio um, puts the, um, the code behind that window that's called the code behind, sort of like in a tree structure under that XAML file. So you kind of understand that this CS is what driving that uh, XAML uh, logic. So the XAML engine creates the interface for us. But what if we want our button to do something? The, these actions can't be described inside, the, inside this declarative document language anymore. Uh, these declarative document, uh, the, the declarative languages have different conventions for describing those actions and logic and stuff like that, depending on where they are. Like for example, in uh, HTML that we talked about before, I'm gonna actually just enlarge this again. In the HTML that we talked about before, if I open my web inspector again, we can see that the uh, HTML has script components uh, inside the page. It could be under head or it could be under the body or it could be anywhere else. Like these are the scripts that are at the end of the body. Um, these components don't have any visual representation. What they do is that they provide some code and logic, like if I open this, there's some JavaScript code and stuff like that, that provides the logic for things that are happening on this page, whether they are user interactions with the components or other things that this page does. Maybe it grabs information from the web and sort of like shows the status of something and whatnot. So anything that's related to logic, it's inside those. That's the HTML convention. For XAML, you can't really do that. So what XAML does is that whatever the language that you're using to sort of like provide the logic for it, it would be the code behind for that language. Uh, for that for that XAML uh, GUI. In this example, we have started a C Sharp project, so the code behind is in C Sharp. When we get to PyRevit and we want to do uh, create these GUI interfaces using Iron Python on Revit, our code behind is going to be in Iron Python language. Um, Visual Studio makes it very easy to create an action for this, so I can double click on this button. It actually generates the action function for me, the event handler function for me that responds to a user clicking on that button and we can put all the logic that we need in here. But see, that logic goes inside that XAML.cs file that's here. Uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about this. Um, I'm gonna 
uh, Surflex stop at this point because what we are going to get into is to uh, actually using R and Python to Surflex provide this code behind and whatnot. Every once in a while, I'm going to come back to this project and sort of like show you how it's done on the C Sharp side and how we can replicate the system on the on the uh, R and Python side. And the way for that is that a lot of times you can use the Visual Studio to sort of like automatically generates the components that you need. Uh, and the functions that you need for you. So kind of know how these things are generated, and then you can reuse this inside your Iron Python environment, inside Pyrovid, on the Revit, uh, to sort of like create the components that you want, because we don't really have a nice Visual Studio environment that works with an Iron Python backend, as far as I know, at least. Um, the last thing that I wanted to show you here is that, um, although we talked about XAML sort of like defining the, uh, the uh, GUI interfaces and documents and stuff, but it's actually a lot more powerful than this. You can define and put together the, uh, the sort of like the hierarchy of other components inside the .NET framework as well. Like for example, if you take a look at this, there's an app.xaml file in here as well. If I open this, it defines the application that we're actually running. It provides the namespace for the app, uh, uh, application, some other stuff. It tells it which one of these XAML files is the main window that needs to be launched. We can define resources around that application and stuff like that. So it's actually using XAML to describe the application itself as well. Um, so it's a lot more extensive than, uh, than just creating GUI interfaces. It's a very, very flexible, general purpose, declarative uh, sort of like document language. Uh, I'm going to stop at this point, and we're going to go back to the list here just to wrap up and talk about the things that we talked about. So I showed you how the uh, how to edit the XAML files inside Visual Studio. There's another application that you could get with Visual Studio that's called, uh, I think it's called Visual Studio Blend or just Microsoft. Blend. And uh, this is sort of like the application that is a heavily customized version of Visual Studio that is very specifically designed to uh, allow you to sort of like create these interfaces a lot easier. So it has a couple of functions that makes it easier for, um, for the user interface designer to create those. The goal, I think, at that point was that the person that is actually writing the code behind and the logic behind the application is using Visual Studio and other user interface designer that do, designers that really don't want to interact with the code and they don't care about the code side, they can open the same project inside Blend and only work with the front end of that application. So it sort of like resembles the, the way we engineers work as backend engineers and the front end engineers. You can use either of these to create these XAML files and they're both, they're both fine. Um, for, the, for our usage, we're going to use the um, Visual Studio because we're going to use, it's more familiar and everybody has worked with it and stuff like that. And it's sort of like easier to work with. Um, so in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, how to create a standard Hello World, very simple window in PyRevit using our own Python and a XAML sort of like file that we write from scratch ourselves. Uh, and sort of like we talked about, we will talk about adding buttons to it and a couple of other functions and stuff like that. And we would create a very simple application that does something in Revit.